Welcome to another episode of Disruptors in the Culture, the podcast where we speak with cultural disruptors and people who are shaking up the game in new ways. Um, my name is Amira Smith. I'm one of your co-hosts along here with my awesome co-host, Joshua Meekin. So Josh, I want you to introduce our awesome guest today, Mr. Marquise Devon. Marquise is an, uh, a, a great person who I've met. Um, <laughs> we actually met officially for the first time at the uh, Mike J Media screenwriting event at Rec Philly, and we got to spend some time. Yeah. I think we went out and got dinner after it, which was really cool. But mm -hmm. I want to introduce my, my friend properly. Marquise Davon is a dynamic educator and content creator committed to advancing community and mental wellness within the Black community. As a trailblazer in the discourse on Black masculinity and mental health, Marquise has become a pivotal voice in opening up crucial conversations and creating accessible resources for those who need them most. Marquise is the creator and host of the Keeping It A Being podcast, a platform that fuses authentic storytelling, global perspectives, and social justice advocacy. Through this podcast, he brings together voices from across the globe to foster connection and build community, all over a simple yet powerful shared moment, a cup of coffee or tea. He's an anime enthusiast, a proud member of the Beehive. Marquise blends his passions with purpose, creating content that not only entertains, but also empowers. His work is a testament to the power of dialogue, culture, and community in driving change. Marquise, man, it is a pleasure to have you <laughs> on the show. I know we've talked about this ever since grabbing dinner. I was like, yo, you'd be perfect yeah. for the podcast. Um, it's a pleasure to have you here, man. Dog, no, nah, thank y'all for having me. I'm I'm big fans of y'all. <laughs> so it was dope. I was like, that was a really fire intro. That's the first time. <laughs> I was like, oh, this is sweet. <laughs> so hearing somebody else do it rather than me send it has been like, well, that was really dope. So thanks for that. <laughs> Absolutely, man. You've you've been play, paving away so far with with your content, mm -hmm. with the stuff that you do in the schools, man. It's it's a it's a blessing. And I mean, I'm excited to have you kind of talk about it today. But I know the first thing that we usually do for our guests is we let you, you know, describe what how do you define what you do oh how do i define what i do mm -hmm. so i like to i just call it storytelling to be honest like my background's um in theater and so it's one of the things i believe is like the purest form of developing empathy because i gotta like you know step into a character's shoes and humanize mm -hmm. them to a certain kind of way but um yeah so i think i just utilize my platform to tell stories and enact positive change um one listener at a time whether in education or podcasting. So, yeah, <laughs> that's good. I mean, I, I mean, it sounds like it starts from the, from the heart, honestly, and make yeah. sure, you know, you can connect that way. Um, it's, it's always funny though, too. Um, people love to say that you are, well, you are a Philadelphia content creator. Like I think you're one yeah. of the, the flag bearers <laughs> in that. Um, but little do they know that you're not originally from Philadelphia. Can mm. you, can you, can you give us the background of how you ended up in this beautiful city? Yeah, so <laughs> um, I'm originally from Reading, Pennsylvania, so I'm about an hour northwest of uh, Philly. <laughs> um, and honestly, I got here by accident. It was the most random leap of faith that I ever took because um, I graduated from college and I became a full time social media and content consultant. And was just like, oh, this is low key kind of miserable. I don't, I don't like having to like tweet for other people, and like the clients I had were just like really boring. Um, but while I was home. I had my podcast called Dear Reading. And so we did a lot of work in terms of like local politics, local media, interviewing local people. So that's really where it all started. And then I woke up one day and was just like, this is miserable. This cannot be my ceiling. And so I quit my job with like, I said, I'm not doing this anymore. I said, I'm miserable. This is wild. And my best friend, Amanda, she hits me and she's just like, yo, there's this job at Penn. It's residential. It pays. You do stuff with restorative justice. She goes, I know, Marquise, you don't like working with kids that much, but at least they're high schoolers. Um, but it was this program called Smash that basically talked around, like, how to utilize STEM for social impact. And from there, I found, like, a love of working with my students, a love of um, innovation and all that stuff. So I ended up at Penn, stayed there for the summer. And my best friend, Amanda, was like, oh, well, I go back to Temple. So since do you want to move in together? And so... From there, I just moved in with her, and the rest is history. I've been here for the last five years. Actually, oh. as of August 26, it'll be five years of being in Philly. So you came right before COVID? Yep, quite literally, and then oh. was inside. Did you spend a lot of time in um, Philly before you moved mm -hmm. out? 
My aunt Eula, she lived right up in uh, Northeast. So we were always up and out of here regularly. It's just, it was a matter of like now living here is a definitely a different experience from just like visiting like once, twice a month. Okay. So yeah. your background is in education, right? Professionally, definitely in education, but I went to school for broadcast journalism and um, theater. So I was a double major. And so I was like, I'm going to go to New York and do all this. I'm going to be on TV and do all this good stuff. Little did I know my major would transform into podcasting. But yeah. And then I professionally went from the tech industry into education now for the last five years. Nice. So do yeah. you feel like... Um... Do you feel like your education, like, well, I mean, for sure, your education in journalism prepared you for potting, but do you, okay, so this is a question just came up for me. Do mm -hmm. you feel like, because, you know, a lot of pods, they just are conversation, right? Yeah. Nothing wrong with people just having conversations, but do you feel like you use a lot of your journalism is in, in facts of like the, the tenets of integrity for journalism in the rules, in the way that you approach podcasting? Absolutely. Yo, it, I didn't realize how much my background in broadcasting and honestly, my role in education, actually, I write out when I was doing my other podcast before it was keeping it a being was called This American Negro. I kind of just rebranded it. Um, but that was scripted out, right? Like I'm taking academic research, I'm taking news articles, I'm like citing sources, all of that good stuff to be able to engage in conversation. So for me, I'm taking Here's the who, what, when, where, how. And then I flipped it and was just like, well, here's the perspective that I think media has been missing. And so when I originally got into podcasting, it was actually like, yo, they're only saying bad things about Reading, Pennsylvania. There is nothing good that they are saying about this city at all. So it's like crime here and crime here. And so I was like, the Reading Eagle is not doing much in terms of like adding that level of nuance. And so for me personally, I was just like, well, how do we humanize the world that we've grown up in and the world that I know? Because I'm like, there's dope people here, but we're just not highlighting them. So I took the idea of local media and we're just like, how do I flip this on its head? And from there, we've had like mayoral candidates come on, the current um, secretary of education. He was on our show. And so it's just like seeing the value of people saying, oh, we finally have another voice that is discussing the news with a little bit more care. That was super important to me in terms of like how I approach it. So there were times where I had to push my team and like take this piece of news and then what did it mean to like present it? And now here's how we are reacting to it. So I definitely had to learn how to balance out the two. And then when I started doing solo podcasting, I was scripting everything out. So I'm writing, I'm just like, cool. What's the intended lesson from this episode? How do I walk people through it? So essentially my lesson plan in terms of like how I'm walking through episodes. So it definitely education and broadcasting tailor my approach to either interviewing people or even um scripting out certain episodes so all right so the chester podcast that was something you did for hire for which one you said that was something you did for hire like you were doing that for an outlet or no the chester podcast just one you oh dear reading yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Dear reading, dear reading. Child. yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i said not chester we did <laughs> Um, but no, I did that just because that was, it'd be seven, eight years ago now wow. that the Dear Reading podcast started. And then when the pandemic happened, we were there for a little bit, but this was all out of just like frustration in college of people wow. being like, you came from Reading? Yeah. How'd you make it? What are you doing? Like, that's broke city. Da, 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 da. So I was kind of mad about it. And so I was just like, let me get actual perspective. So it was myself and three other co-hosts. We first started around the phone. And I would just upload it on my voice notes and then I would go upload it to um, SoundCloud. Mm. And then every Monday morning, people were just like, well, what's a podcast? I don't know how this thing works, right? So this is before podcasts are like uber popular. Yeah. And so I'm just like, for me to be the second podcast to pop up in my hometown, there was one more before me, but everybody was tuned in every Monday morning. People would come into the um, spot that we would be at and just be like, can I just sit in? I don't know what this is, but I love like the talking aspect of it. So we had people in this hot ass house apartment <laughs> gathered around a cell phone and just engaging in conversation. And it felt so new to people, but it was like the first time I saw podcasting as like a very communal aspect, especially on a local level. And so honestly, people were coming in to just talk 15 or 16 episodes in a studio in my hometown reached out and said, yo, your sound could be so much better. I'd want to do this for free because I love what you're doing for the city. 
Pagoda City Studios put us in there. And from there, it was myself, Marie, Daquan, and Bree. And it was like, I wanted to curate it because I was just like, I have my bachelor's. Another one had an associate's. Another one had just a high school diploma. Another one didn't have a high school degree diploma at all. So I was really intentional around just like, I don't want my perspective to be the only one because I have the degree. I was like, here is real people talking about real things with different perspectives. And Reading's also like a huge Latino city. So like, for me, I was just like, what is the black millennial experience and how are we talking about it? And that's how we were able to like do an entryway into it. Wow, that's that's powerful. I mean, mm-hmm. it, it, they always say like early adopters, especially you said you were the second podcast within the city. So yeah. like automatically, and you know, people are are tuned in and they're glued to kind of what's new and what's going on mm-hmm. kind of with that podcast. And to your to your point, how did you kind of take that experience and then transition it to your next podcast, which then mm-hmm. eventually was rebranded into keeping it a bean? But how mm-hmm. how did that uh how did that experience translate? And then how have you kind of now oh. curated it into what you have now? It was so it was honestly interesting because I, I came home and, you know, I got I got my degree. I studied abroad. I did all this stuff. So I came home. I said, down with white supremacy, patriarchal capitalism. Da, 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 da. And my older brother said, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> I said, all right, Malcolm. Um, but hearing him say that, it made me realize, like, one, I was speaking a completely different language. Mm-hmm. Right. And so. A lot of people were like, yo, Marquise, I love the perspective you're bringing home because it's not something that our city gets to experience all the time. And when you think like Reading is like you go there, you settle down, like real hometown feel to it. And so a lot of people were like, we love what you do on Dear Reading, but we would love to know around like, how did you get to your politic? How did you Mm -hmm. get to your perspective? How did this happen? And so I had realized that though people love the conversational aspect of it and love like me dissecting the news, a lot of them were just like, yeah, but this is only the tip of the iceberg. Like, how did you get here? And so from there I created this American Negro and that was called, that was my way to bridge academia in the hood. So I'm just like, the stoop niggas can, can like listen to this stuff. And then also those in academia can listen to it. How do I bridge those worlds together? And so from there I was taking academic research on like probably something like sexual liberation and connected it to um, Janet Jackson's um, self-titled album, right? And it was just like, here's an entry point from pop culture, but let's analyze it based on like, how are Black women perceived? What is this idea of Black girls being too grown, X, Y, and Z? So it took like very regular things that Black people would say, Mm -hmm. but what did it mean for me to like intellectualize it, break it down and actually give voice to something that a lot of our community feels and hears, but we sometimes don't know how it happened. So I love like being able to take like academic research or journals or um, long form essays and breaking it down and just serving as a communicator of information, but also being able by the end after communicating information, lean into like, what do I think about this thing? Yeah. So it kind of evolved from there. This American Negro wasn't overly like people, when you hear this American Negro, they were like, so wait, you're what? (laughs) And so for me, I had realized it's not the most marketable name in the world. Yeah. Um, still hold true to it. So when I do like long form videos and essays and stuff, I lean back and say, this is more American Negro. Um, but it transitioned easily into keeping it a bean because I was like, I get to explore more topics. I didn't want to be pigeonholed, but I was like, oh, okay, this brings together all the things I love. Conversation, coffee, dialogue, pontificating, all these ideas and stuff like that. And so... Um, once I transitioned it to this American, um, from this American Negro to keeping it a bean. And mind you, this is only a year ago at this point. So 2023 is when I decided to do this and transition. And it was difficult because I'm really big on like maintaining my authenticity. I don't like having to change for anybody, but that simply changing the name, but maintaining the integrity of what the original show was. People are still banging with it and they love that I was able to bring back the conversational aspect. So it's not just a solo podcast. It's inviting other voices in and you get the, it feels a lot more relaxed than like, all right, let me sit down and read this article and do this and do this. It feels even more accessible for people. So with keeping it a bean, um, who's your, like, who are your ideal guests? Like, cause it's like pretty much anyone, but to deepen the conversations that you want to have, like, do you have, is there, are there certain types of guests you seek out as far as in like niching into like your topics, your audience? Yeah. So 
I like to really just bring on my friends a lot of the time, if I'm going to be honest, like if it's more specific, like I know like the content I'm about to have in a few interviews I have lined up, they're a little bit more politically leaning and social justice based leaning. So I have people like Salah Muhammad coming in. I have um, a couple others coming in as political strategists, Tamir Harper and stuff like that. And that's important to me because I'm just like, I want to be very responsible with like the original aspect of why I created this platform. And like, I'm still a socially responsible platform at the end of the day. Um, but like being able to just sit down with my friends who see the non like platformed Marquise, like people see me on Twitter and just like, Hey, I would love to hear you talk around these things, but to see me lay back and laugh, cackle, mm. but also like, just do like, Hey, let's just check in this episode. Let's talk around. Like, how do you go grocery shopping? But like lean into like conversations on masculinity, insecurity, um, disappointment, rejection, all of these topics, especially because a majority of my guests that come on are black men. It feels like a different space for a lot of people because it's also not like the, oh, black women suck and da 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 and like just nonsensical. It's honestly a time to sit down and honestly just gather around like the kitchen table and talk around like a lot of real things that happen. And I realize it's a space that is needed because it doesn't feel preachy, but it's just like, back to the essence of storytelling. And so you're like, I don't know this person, but I love what they had to say. And I can take this life lesson from it. So it doesn't feel like I'm like, you need to do this in order to be better and blah, 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 blah. Like, nah, people don't respond to that, but people do respond to like, here's what I took from this. Okay. So the bean is like a coffee bean, but cause says everybody doesn't drink coffee. So it's almost like, you know how Seinfeld has um, comedians in cars getting coffee. Yeah. <laughs> I'm taking a ride. Getting That's coffee, all it is. Talking but you're just and like here at the table. So keeping it a bean, keeping it a hundred. It's your most authentic space. Like it's just like a really big play on words. For I was sure. an English teacher. Can you tell? <laughs> right. So when you, um, like you talk a lot about mental health and masculinity, mm -hmm. masculinity specifically. Um, I guess like what makes you as passionate as you are about them? Because you would think with, the passion that you have for that you would you would would have come out with like a psychology or therapy or social work <laughs> background. Yeah. Um, but like kind of what drove you into the, being very passionate about that specifically? Honestly, it was uh my family. Like um when I met my father I met my dad for the first time when I was twenty four. Um and so like seeing the ways in which like he just did not have like a support system in a certain kind of way and he wasn't able to talk around like his anxiety his mental health disorder like a lot of this stuff he just kind of kept private which resulted into him ultimately going to prison for 24 years and trying to like navigate that space um so it was like a combination of that and then also realizing that i personally i didn't realize until i got to college like i had a very unique experience in terms of guy friends that i had growing up and so we would sit on the porch and granted, we were 16. We had no business having 40s and eat peach E&J sitting at night. Like We should not have been doing it. <laughs> um, but we would do that because, you, know, you know, we can afford or whatever. Yeah. Um, but 16 and we're just sitting there talking around life. And I remember it was me, Raul, Chris and Naquan. And we would just sit there and Raul, his family was undocumented. My boy, Chris, like he dealt with a lot of abuse growing up. Um, and a lot of different things that were happening. And so we were just like, dog, where do we go? And so one night we all cracked the bottle and Chris is crying. I'm crying. Raul is crying. <laughs> like, and I was like, okay. But I felt safe with that kind of friend group and stuff. And so my fa my siblings would always be like, Marquise, this is not normal. Like, I don't, I don't have more than like two friends that I feel like I can trust. And like for you to have guy friends that you trust, that's different. And so... I didn't pay attention to that kind of messaging until getting to college and realizing like, oh, I have a space that's important, right? And I valued that space a lot, but did not realize until I got to college, like how foreign that space actually was until I created like a men's group in my, um, at college for black men to come in and like unpack masculinity and really just want a safe space to talk and all this. And so I had realized like that has always been a passion of mine and it's always an experience I had but I didn't realize until later on in life, like, oh, me not having a dad, I didn't know where to start with masculinity. And my mom did the best she could. She had four boys and a girl. I'm in the middle of five, very different. <laughs> yeah. 
And then um, my f f initial friend group of guys, we were able to be vulnerable with each other in that way. Get into college, it hit to me even harder. Like, oh, we just don't have space at all. And I was so used to it. And then once I graduated and went home, uh, when I met my dad for the first time, it was like, Oh, so like seeing him like listen to my shows and just being like, I wish I could have talked about this when I was younger. I just don't feel like I had the space. It actually made me lean into that more, which ultimately is how I went into education. The work that I do in education, all that good stuff around like SEO, restorative justice and all of that, that has been my journey in terms of like how I became passionate around masculinity and mental health. So that's amazing because I mean, even in like you talk about just masculine spaces, like just telling your story, I feel like I didn't even get a chance to kind of like learn kind of what that space looked like mm -hmm. until like high school, end of high school. I went to something yeah. called SDLC. I don't know if you guys heard of that, but it's Student Diversity Leadership Conference where like all the diverse kids in private school all get flown out <laughs> to some city with other diverse kids in private school. And you guys really like share your experiences. You have different groups. And there was a black men's group where I was like, oh, snap, like I'm not the only one kind of going through all this. And then going to college, um, I think that conference kind of equipped me with the tools to seek out and search for other black men who are specifically mm -hmm. kind of going what I'm going through. And I was able to, you know, give me a little bit of the, the verbiage to communicate and say, OK, this is my experience. OK, I know you have a similar experience. How can we kind of build community around that? which is really cool. Um, so to, to see that that's something you found early and were able to develop mm -hmm. into like not only a, a safe space for you, but continue to create that space as you travel along is, is uh, again, a blessing and a testament to like, you know, you being able to just um, amplify that emotion for everybody else, mm -hmm. which is, which is amazing. Um, yeah, thank you. But I, I use that to transition to, um, it really does seem like you're kind of uniquely equipped to talk about the things that um, happen on your podcast, which as it should be, um, uh, why do you feel like, or like what type of unique voice do you want to make sure that you kind of put out into the world, to the world through this medium? Um, honestly, honesty, to be mm. honest, uh, no, well, the redundant, <laughs> but whatever. Um, but I realize, excuse me, that, and I'm not always like the big representation matters type situation, but I do realize like my platform is a window to give black men permission to simply be. And I try to just, I realize like some people need mirrors, some people need windows. And I took that philosophy from education of just like being a black male educator that's not normal for black kids to see. Yeah. Um, and so I was like, cool, this is insight to who I am as a person. And so if other people are able to see me like cackle and laugh and get things wrong and apologize and discuss like, and they don't get every little piece of insight to my life. Like there are some things that are just for me and my therapist. <laughs> um, but it is important that like, as I work through that process that I'm able to be reflective. And so you may not hear me talk around a subject in the very beginning or while I'm going through it because yeah. I have not fully processed the thing, but like a couple months later, I'll be like, Hey, gather me some of my boys. And we will just kind of be like, Hey, do you want to talk about this? Cool. And so it definitely gives a space to talk around it from a space of at least in the process of healing, or at least I've been able to like work through like the worst parts of it. And so now I can like healthily reflect on this thing. And so I try to be responsible in the space of like, don't lean into like my immediate emotional reaction, but also understanding that these conversations to be had on a public level mm -hmm. is important for other black men to see. It's important for other black women to see black femmes to see um, because once people started reaching out, I was just like, oh, you helped me connect with my son better. I sent my husband to go watch you. You helped me connect with him better. Like that to me is like some of the more impactful stuff because now it's a tool. People have told me they use my content in classrooms. I said, I got a potty mouth. Like, I don't know if you should always like, you know, <laughs> um, but despite like all the cussing and stuff, I had old teachers reach out. I was just like, yo, Marquise, like, I'm so proud of you. I got to talk about your show in my classroom and showed some of my students about it. And so the fact of like my content has also been utilized in people's curriculum for like social emotional learning and restorative conferencing and stuff like that, that to me is like the impact, even if depending on where numbers are at and how people are utilizing it, I realize it's a resource. So do you, I guess, I feel like America for sure you know, masculinity overall. It's not just mm -hmm. like masculinity. Um, men don't leave space for men to have emotions, 
to about most yeah. anything except for anger. Oh um, yeah. <laughs> you know, so it's like um if you could point to the one thing that you wish um which I guess was probably already answering it, but one thing that you wish that was the the key takeaway that you want like hey, brother, it's okay to be or it's okay to whatever. What would you want them to like soak in the most from your content? It's okay to know that you're enough, right? Like as simple as that. I think sometimes we try to perform to be other people. And mm -hmm. as boys, we become men very early on. And so we're expected to be providers. We're expected to take lead on some stuff. We're expected to protect. Um, but like understanding like how you're showing up right now is enough. I try to tell people like, if you are under the age of 19, you're still a boy. Like, <laughs> And I don't call um, any of my students, I don't call them young men. I'm like, you are still boys because I don't want to adultify you in the way the world, the rest of the world is going to grow up. So I hope that black men are able to still understand that they are just enough as is, and that we are always going to be a work in progress. So as long as you are holding yourself accountable and also affirming in yourself, like that's enough. I think that's powerful because even like a couple of even things that you said, like uh, the young black boys get adultified from like pre-K, mm -hmm. like they, they are considered looked at like adults, their behavior is judged on, 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 in ways that, you know, you can't even imagine, but that that's just, you know, how we grow up and which is, mm -hmm. which is nuts. Um, and at the same time, being able to just let men feel as if they're enough. I mean, that, I'm not going my, through my own personal struggles, but like that's a conversation that I've had with my therapist. That's a conversation that I, you know, have to reinforce myself every day. Um, and I think that's just like being a, a black man or a man in America. You know, yeah. there's just certain things we don't talk about, certain things that are taboo. Um, so I, I do think that's incredibly powerful. And I, I want to, our, our listeners, to, we, we also give them gems about, you know, how we create this type of stuff, how you create yeah. this type of space, just the, the logistics. Mm -hmm. um, how do you even go about like scheduling some of the people that you have on your show? Like you are, if you're having some pretty prominent names, how are you reaching out to them? Like if you are to give somebody a tip, like, hey, take your, take yourself to the next level. Don't be afraid to, to shoot that shot. How are you shooting your shots? Yeah, honestly, I just, I just do it, right? Like there are some people I come in and I'm just like, all right, you are, I would love to have you on the show. And so I also show like also an invested interest in terms of the people I would love to bring on as well. And so it's not like I'm going to be like, oh, yeah, just like, come on so you can promote this thing. And da, 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 da. I don't care for stuff like that. That takes away the authenticity. Uh, when I tell them, I'm just like, yo, I love I saw what you were talking around in your story. I would love to explore this a little bit more. Um, would you be interested in coming on the show? I would love to just like sit down and rap with you and have a cup of coffee mm -hmm. with you or whatever. Um, so it's like super simple. It's nothing like super rigorous. Um, I'm a quick slide into a DM. And most people that have been on the show, I know them personally. And so it's been like just, a, hey, you busy Monday night? Would you like to come through and just like chat about some things? And so for me, it's nothing like too extravagant unless it's like a bigger name where I'm just like, hey, I have a very specific topic I would like to talk about. Can we explore this thing? And here's kind of like the cadence of what I would love to do. Two different approaches, but those are two different types of guests. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah, I think that we always like to try to give away tips and tricks too for people developing their stuff because even from this conversation, like you're you're well polished. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> We've heard the podcast. We we know you're you're well polished. So just yeah, giving yeah, people yeah. to you know who may starting out their podcasting journey and just kind of want to know like you know I want to I want to make this ask. I want to have someone on the podcast, but how do I do it? You know what I mean? Yeah, just giving them those tips to shoot the shot. And it's honestly just honestly just do it. Like you'd be surprised on the amount of people who are just willing to want to be heard. And mm -hmm. just want to talk because it feels new. Like people are still getting platformed and just like, what's this podcasting? I want to try it. Like, yeah. So it's still something fun for people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah. there's a lot of money in podcasting. There is. Always <laughs> money in it. You got to just uh, not, you know, there's, 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 there's best methods, there's ads. ads Look, ads. I, child, that's the, I'm just starting to get into that space. I said, oh, I don't like doing the money part of this thing. Like, <laughs> I mean, it's, you're selling minutes. You're selling 30 second yep. spots in mm -hmm. pre, mid, and post roll. That's all yep. you're doing. Everything else, live, that's extra live potting. That's extra revenue, yep. merch. But really, you're selling minutes. So it's like, go to the mama pop businesses and ask them, mm -hmm. hey, you want to buy an ad? You know? Yep. And, and that's really where the money truly resides. Right. You know? Truly, truly, truly in companies that maybe want to put an ad, especially ones that align with your message. Um. So when you, if someone 
do you have any highlights of your show so far? Like, so I'm, I'm finding this like really, really interesting with you having like a theater background. Yeah. Um, so when you say theater, you were looking to do Broadway or a motion picture? Not actually uh, more Broadway, but not even to be on stage. I was the um, dramaturg of theater. So I was the one who would analyze. So a dramaturg is like, they would kind of be like your theater historian or like they're your theater critic. And so I was the one to go into a play and I would do like the talkbacks with the audience. Like, hey, what did you experience? What does this word mean? So I'd assist the director in terms of like, taking down the script and just like, cool, what should the set actually look like? What is historically, histor historically accurate? What's the social, political, and economic context of the play in terms of the space that was made? So like for me, um, I focused in on lynching dramas and like, how does that translate into um, today's literature that we see? And so like the themes around like black women would still be the protagonist, but like the house was the safety for black people. The outside was like the, the danger we still see a similar theme happen, but it turned into like police violence and gun violence versus it being lynching now. And so like, there are still similar themes that, that go from 1896 all the way till 2024 that we are still grappling with, but it gives you kind of like your anthropological approach to, so I like to do the nerd stuff, of so it. but I did enjoy like dancing primarily. Yeah. I was a big dancer um, kind of person and actor. So you would be working with the production and um, helping them workshop it, I guess, before they lock before they lock the play or like, you know, when they set it where after previews is done, this is what the show is going to be every, every, every day. Um, yep. Was there some money in that or like, Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I'm going to stay paying people. To be yeah, I'm, I ain't never like there are some people who literally like hire dramaturgs. So we'd be kind of like a pseudo assistant director. So the director That's would dope. have the vision and then how they would like the set to be designed the costumes, the accents, where that's at that's what I would essentially be a consultant on. And so people do hire people to do dramaturgy for them. Um, but it just depends on like how invested they are in the play and like the money that comes along with it. Did so you, did you have a specialty in regions or something, or is it just like you would just go and do the research on like if this set, if it was set in this city or this town, mm -hmm. you would go do the research. I just did the research. So um, I did a play called uh, Vinegar Tom. And so it was essentially like, let's talk around feminism but how did they do the witch trials out in Essex? So I had to figure out like, what was going on with women, women at this time? How is this playwright trying to utilize feminist thought to like bring these worlds together and how's that communicating on? The other one was um, Susan Laurie Parks's um, Top Dog Underdog, which explores yeah. like the black, two black brothers and their experience together in terms of like their relationship to each other. So I was a dramaturg, but I also played the role of Lincoln. And so like that role was definitely like, let me get my research. Let me memorize these scripts. <laughs> I missed it. I missed that play twice. I missed yeah. it when it first came on Broadway when most Def was in it. Yep. Young. And then last ooh, a year or two ago. Yeah, yeah, do my team. Yeah, yeah, do my team. And yep. um who was the other person? I don't think oh, it was man. Ali Ali. It was someone else though. Another another big name. Yes, yeah, so was yeah, he was just in um the color purple and I'm his name is alluding. Oh, me. you're talking about uh oh my gosh. Corey. Uh, oh no, not him. Never mind. <laughs> no, you Corey from um Straight Out of Compton, right? Yes. Yeah. I, I was thinking, um, name. what's the other dude? No matter, oh, it wasn't him. Like, <laughs> it wasn't. It wasn't. <laughs> but um because I I'm just asking because I'm like, that's a that's something that could translate into motion pictures mm -hmm. where people could use you. For that type of, yeah. Because you know, that's honestly work. like I I loved it because I I like when people get to experience plays and experience shows, but like you can curate what does the experience beyond the play look like or beyond the motion picture look like. So this is where I like to just be like, hey, if you want this set in Mobile, Alabama, I can give you all the research of a very specific time. And so like I'd be I would love to be somebody's consultant on like, hey, if you're interested in like what was the dialect what was going on socially and politically how does this bring this into the world i think that stuff is so dope because i'm just like it gives you a reason to go back and like love on the film a little bit more or appreciate it or people from that region are just like somebody actually did their research and they get it so it's like yeah. just heightens that experience for those who want to really understand what you're talking about that's like research and development in the writer's room 
like yeah, being absolutely. able to like know what's going on. That's that's. Mm-hmm. Hey, listen, don't don't close your door yet. See if you yeah. see if you can oh, figure well, out some projects and period pieces. This is the thing I'm trying to do when I get back. When I get to thirty, I'm just like, cool. This is where I'm gonna like really um, lean back into is like really uh, finding my love of theater again. Like I have August Wilson's guy to play writing. I have all of his plays literally looking at them right now. Like that's. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you need people like that on set because yeah. even dialect coaches who all, all they're doing is they have headset on and then when their accent gets false, they like mm-hmm. pipe in and they're like, wait a minute, uh-uh. Which is wild. I'm just and like, I wish. That was my least, that was the least, my least talent in like any theater. I was just like, don't ask me to do no damn accents. It is horrid. <laughs> and all, and all they do is just, just listen. My boy Nakia, mm-hmm. he was, um, Idris Elba's dialect coach on huh. Concrete Cowboy. Oh snap! He just, had, he just had headphones and he would listen, and he'd be like, "You know what? Mm-mm, that wasn't that line, that line wasn't right." Mm-hmm. Sharpen the A more, and then he like, "Oh, that's dope." Direct them into sounding to get it, you know, get it together, you know. Huh. There's money in there, and most the fix was, you know. Look, let me, okay, maybe I need to. <laughs> We're trying to open a door for you. you feel Look, what I'm okay, saying? You're, 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 you're opening my eyes to some things. <laughs> yeah. Um. All right, so. What do, what, do, what, do you, what are you thinking, Josh? Because I was definitely, I wanted um, to delve into a little bit of education too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Talk, give, give us a little, so you are an educator. Do you, so do, what, do you, do you, what do you specifically teach? Yeah, so um, I was teaching high school literature. So I started out in fifth grade. That's okay. a special place for people, not for me. Don't love yep. me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, but I love um, tenth, ninth and 10th grade literature is what I was teaching. And so more of like the literary dissection pieces of it all. Um, so that was dope writing. And then, um, I also, um, whatchamacallit, I created curriculum as well for a black masculinity course, which brought together feminist thought, um, social, emotional learning and life skills, um, into the classroom. So I'd use that as a seminar, um, for my students. Cause I worked at an all boys high school. So it was a really good way to like bring them into like this development piece yeah. too. That's right. Yeah. You worked at the, you, you worked, I know where you worked. I, I forgot when you said, oh, boys, I said, wait. And I'm like. Oh, yeah, BL. Yep. <laughs> yep. Um, so do you have, how do you feel like, do your, do your students ever discover the pod? And the how child, they find the podcast before they find the answers in a book sometimes. I'd be so <laughs> mad. <laughs> I'd be so mad. Um. Yeah. So for me, and also just as like a caveat, I actually left the classroom last year for the first time because I needed a break from it. So now I work in college access work over at Temple. So like that's where I'm doing my work now. Um, But yeah, when the kids found my podcast, they were like, oh, you do your little hey, black man or your good morning to niggas and niggas only. There you go again. I'm just like, watch your mouth. (laughs) We're in the class. I'm not your friends. Um, But it was dope because when they began to find like what I do, being a content creator and also working in spaces that are sensitive as education, I told all parents, I was like, my page is not private. Like this is also a source of income for me. And so like, just so you know, I'm never going to like talk about your kids or name them or any of that kind of stuff, but just know like my platform is open. And so if they do happen to find me, here's what it is. Um, So I had like a very honest conversation with the schools that I worked at. I had an honest conversation with the parents um, that as well. But high key, the parents were watching my stuff before I even <laughs> before I taught their kids. And so the mom said, like, "Why do you look familiar?" And I said, mm. <laughs> um, "And so it's just stuff like that." And so the kids found it, but they appreciated it a lot more because it showed that I wasn't just Mister Richards. They got to also see different aspects of Marquise, and so it actually opened up a space for them to come in the next day and just be like yo, you was really talking some good stuff on that podcast. And like for them to hear the conversation and hear grown black men talking the way that we were talking, that felt to them safe because they would then come in and ask questions. I'd be trying to get them to do some work and they'd be like, yeah, but Mr. Marquis, like, or Mr. Richards, how are you actually feeling? (laughs) And so that to me was like important because it also felt like they also saw a lot of my activism as well. And so they were just like, yo, you were out here on the streets with us. Like you really are about this. You don't just say you're about it. So to see like, you are also this kind of person and you come to work every day. I don't know how you do the balance, but thank you for what you do. And so there's a level of appreciation that my students largely have taken. And then it's all like, when am I getting on your show? And I'm just like, mm, not till you're 18. 
<laughs> I got to I got to applaud you for that coming from somebody who's worked in the college access space for 9 mm-hmm. years. I have worked with like it's it's first of all people don't understand like the labor of love that it is as well as like the passion and you know what you do for it but the simple impact and I I, I probably know you felt the same way that you have on the children itself especially the children that look like you yeah like, you can't it's that's an unmeasurable impact there are a lot of there aren't enough black men specifically mm-hmm. in education itself and then ones that are vocal enough to build relationships and also let students feel comfortable to also explore themselves. When I mean explore yeah. themselves as far as like let their personality shine. You know what yeah. I mean? So it, it's a, a lot of times that stuff gets stifled. So like a, a definitely applause to you. And how did, how did you navigate you and coming out of the classroom and now going into the mm-hmm. college, the educational access space? Like, cause those are also two very different like things. Different worlds. Exactly. Yeah. What, what was that transition like for you? Oh, I was sad at first. I was just like, you know, like for me, like working at the school I worked at and you have grown, like not grown, but like big boys, like I'm six, two already. So they'll see some of them like six, three, six, four and being like, Mr. Mr. Rich, like, where's my hug? Where, what's going on? So like they, the school already knew if I was ever late or if I was not at my door, when the students were walking up them steps, they said, Mr. Rich, you need to get to your door. You got a line of boys waiting to go give you a hug to, so they can start their day. Like, <laughs> And so you start to build that kind of relationship. And so for parents, they were just like, oh, like you were the only teacher that made my kid like reading. You were the only teacher who gave my son space to like explore his emotions. Like that, that was hard to leave because I was just like, I felt like I was guilting. I was, I felt guilty for leaving. Cause I'm just like, you, you build a relationship for two years and then for you to not be there and you being such, for me being a staple in the school, that felt off. So like there were kids who have tried to leave class so they can learn in my room. And that was hard. Um, But I had realized by March of 2023, I was like, yo, I am burnt out. Like I don't have space for Marquise. I was tired. I was coming to um, class miserable. And I always, I never wanted to be the teacher who was just like, why are you still teaching if you hate kids? (laughs) Why are you still doing this? And it's not that I hated kids, but I had realized I was just like, so much of Mr. Richards is happening, but not enough time is for Marquise. And so I was not doing as well with my podcast. I wasn't happy with the work. I was I was still doing it, but like it did not bring me joy the way it's bringing me joy now, nor did I have space to just like be because it's like I'm leaving at 645 and I'm not getting home till 515 um, commuting from West Philly to North Philly. Like I, th- those are just it's time I don't have anymore. And then don't let them have a play or a basketball game or a football game there. Well, I want you to be there. And so I had realized like transitioning out, I still wanted to work in youth development. Um, But for me, I was just like, I need something that's going to pay me more and allows me space to still um, be me. And I was like, I don't want that 40 to 50 minute commute. If SEPTA doesn't want to work right type situation Mm -hmm. anymore, I want to be able to walk to work again. And so um, ended up leaving that I, there was my first summer I ever took off. I was just like, cool. I'm not working at another summer program. I'm not doing any like summer school type stuff. I just wanted time for me. So I did that. Um, but for me, it was just like, what comes next? Did I want to go back into the social media and, um, content consulting space? I was just like, no, the millennial me still needs some benefits. So I'm not going to do that. <laughs> um, but I still wanted to work with kids cause I was still purpose driven. And so once um, the position opened up at Temple to be their assistant director of their Upward Bound program, I was like, nope, like I'm going to focus on getting black and brown kids into STEM first and foremost. That goes back to the first job that I had here in Philly. So I was able to just easily transfer those skills right over. And this is definitely a little bit more instant gratification happens from here because it's quite literally like I helped you and your family get you to college and here are all the scholarships we got you. So it's not like that long game that educators play of just like, they ain't going to say thank you until it's like well years after Mm -hmm. the fact. Um, But I definitely found myself still loving this space, but it made, it gave me space to now only have like a 10 minute walk to work now. And then also I have time to say, cool, I can block out time here. I can block out time here. I can be flexible here. I'm working from home this day. Like I'm not confined to one space, which for me has been like, such a need for me. Mm-hmm. And so I needed the flexibility. I needed the time, but it still allows me to work with kids. And so it was definitely a little bit of an adjustment because office life is real boring. <laughs> like, yeah. it you said, you said when you get to your 30, so you're not 30 yet. I'm 28. I'll be 29 in September. Yeah, I think 
yeah, I think you needed you needed to scale back because it's like, dang, I'm like you you kind of you don't realize it. It feels like light years away, but it's like you you posted up students age like <laughs> you deserve a little ease uh, yeah. to ease into some things like you yeah. know or or your or your life to not just be consumed with your job, you know, mm. yes, and to be able to build the other things that you're you're building towards and working on. Yeah, because I was scared that I was going to start missing opportunities, if I'm going to be fully honest. Like, I like while I was teaching, I was doing speaking engagements. I was talking at different conferences. I was a keynote speaker. I'm looking at all these things. I'm just like, dog, I'm doing some. I got an award for my podcast. I'm in uh, academic journals. So I'm just like, dog, this is like really moving in a way where I'm just like, education will always be here. But I don't want to miss out on this opportunity that I feel is happening right now in terms of like the content creation space. And I really wanted to like lean into that a little further. So that was super important. And it was like, I don't like being selfish a lot. I felt selfish for doing it. Um, but I it was the first big decision I made that was truly centering myself for the first time as a recovering people pleaser. I was just like, let me just, Marquise, this is for you. This is not for your students this is not for your mom. It's not for your dad, your siblings. This is for you. Um, so that was definitely uncomfortable. So I had to get used to just being like, you're going to disappoint somebody, but you're at least putting yourself first for the first time. And that was really nice. I'm really happy you mentioned that because that was going to be part of the question I was going to ask you, but you <laughs> already expanded on it. That that commitment to oneself when you know that you, this is something you're passionate about and what you want to do. Mm -hmm. I feel like a lot of creatives go through it. We always talk about that moment of like when you leapt and went into the thing that you wanted to do. Um, you know, for, for it's, it's, it's something you have in your, your soul and your mm -hmm. purpose. But yeah. A lot of us creatives think we're being so selfish and we think being selfish is wrong, but a lot of times putting yourself first and being able to accomplish the things that you need to accomplish to advance yourself is just helping everybody else. What does it say? Like yeah. uh, a rising ship lifts all time. What did Armani said it on our podcast and that it's, it's a rising shift, li a rising tide lifts rising all ships. Rising tide lifts all ships. Yep. He, yeah. he said, it, and that was like, he was like, the better I do, the more I can lift everybody up around me, which yeah. I think is like the dopest thought process. And I think that's really how you got to move about it. Mm -hmm. No, thank you. I'm going to keep that drawing with me. Yeah. <laughs> Shout out Armani White. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, he, he gave us that. Even the example you give for your, like, let's say your former students to go for it, you know, mm -hmm. like if you don't, I think that's the biggest disservice people can do, whether it's your parent or anything else. If you don't go for it yourself, it's real hard to preach it. Yo. And, and people so, believe it. I'm so happy you brought that up. That um, takes me to my mentee. He was just like, I don't want you teaching no other kids, but don't forget the promise you made. He was just like, you wanted time to focus on your podcast. You wanted time to focus on your content and like being out here and doing that. He goes, you're, you're leaving us. And we understand, we also did not expect you to stay here as, we didn't expect you to be here for 10 years. We didn't expect you to be here for that long. Mm -hmm. We knew that you had so much potential for other things. So to hear 17, 18, 16 year olds say this kind of thing to me and remind me of like why I stepped out, like that to me was most important. And so mm -hmm. he's always, he texted me, don't forget, yo Rich, you, you know, you remember what you did. You're holding true to your promise. And that to me was like super important. So it was funny, like as soon as you mentioned that, Amir, I was just like, oh, you took me right to that conversation I had when I told my mentees that I was leaving the school for the first time. And I was like, I don't want to disappoint them. They have big tests coming up. Da -da 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 -da. They're going to be. But to hear them like just be like, nah, Rich, like you got this. Like we are so excited. We watch your show. We you inspired us to do this. Like you can't say go after your dreams and like not do the thing that you said that you want us to do. He was like, you're all about keeping it a bean, right? Being authentic, right? And I, was, I said, "Sweet, who are you talking to?" Like, <laughs> Listen, the kids, yeah. the kids see it and they know. Like, yeah. um, there's times where, so you know, seen articles where women leave the workforce and they mm -hmm. stay, they become a stay at home mom, but then they're crushed when their daughters are like eight and they're like, "I'm gonna be a mommy," and they're just like, "Oh, you're, no. you're, what about school?" But it's like, but that's what you did. Yep. Yeah, you went to school and you became a lawyer and then you left it all to be a mom. And there's nothing wrong with that, right? Right. But it's like what's in your heart, you gotta go after it. You have to. Or mm -hmm. preaching it, people gonna be like, oh, okay, yeah, well, what, what did you do? Right. You know? Like, and I never wanna like live that. Like one of my biggest fears is just like having like a wish would have, could have, should have type situation by like end of life. I wanted to always be a space like when I have kids, when my students see me, like oh, I remember Mr. Marquise or Mr. Rich when he did da 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 Like that to me 
is important because I don't want to live and get to the end of life and just wish I would have done something. And that's how I'm like, education will always be aligned to my purpose, but like podcasting and content creation, that's the space where I get this be me without compromise. Like I've been rewarded for simply just being Marquise, which is why I continue to say like, oh, I'm enough. Like podcasting got me awards. Podcasting got me the ability to travel to different places. It got me to speak in engagements. It got me to flex, be a lot more flexible, to flex those pieces of myself that I've always wanted. Sometimes working in education, I'm confined to the politics of it all. And so like, that's where I'm like, I'm good at this, but here's the stuff that like fills my soul in a very different kind of way. When you, if for people who want to, they might say, okay, I'm going to check out Keep It In The Being, who might have not heard of you. What mm -hmm. are the top three episodes, like your faves that you would say, okay, check these out. <laughs> if you want to, if you want to check them, check me out, check, see these episodes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you want to check me out, uh, watch the one with myself, Balmore and Cody. It's entitled Smell the Pineapple Butt. <laughs> okay. <laughs> We'll play that one tonight. <laughs> those are those are my brothers. Like we talked around, like we do like mental health check-ins with each other, but he was kind of talking around um when he goes grocery shopping, he's like real serious. So if you you can either pick the leaf or you can smell the pineapple butt so you can see. It. So it's a whole thing. So people send me pineapples regularly now. Very annoying, but it's I'm not bad. It's different. <laughs> Um, another one is with, um, my mentee Suhaib. So what it was it? So I got to interview him of like, what was it like being my mentee and what's it like for him having me as a mentor? So I, I really love being able to have that intergener intergenerational component to it as well. And then I think the other one that I really had a good time on, um, what I do with Elijah Ray, black excellence is a scam. Um, so for me, that was another one where we get to kind of unpack what does it mean? What are the pressures we put on ourselves as black people to always be consistently excellent? But how is that serving as a way to like burn us out much faster and doesn't allow us to like navigate our own imperfections? And so I really love like those three episodes in particular because you get to see the little bit of the intellectual muscle flex. There's a funniness to one of the episodes and the other one is like just real life conversation with a 17 year old kid who was trying to figure out life and was the person who was like, no, Rich, you said you were going to do this. Like, please follow on with your promise. So those are probably like three episodes I would say watch. Okay. So, yes. all right, let's get into the other stuff about Marquise. So you're an yeah. anime head. Yes. <laughs> so yes. What's, your favorite, what's your favorite anime? Oh, uh, t n my number one is Death Note. I love Death Note. A lot of people say that. A lot of people huh? That's a lot of people say that. They're like, definitely. Yeah, I love like the ethical battle. Like, who, what is justice? What is not justice? Who's allowed to have this much power type situation? Um, I love it. Um, and then Roroni Kenshin is another one. And then also um, Full Metal Alchemist is another one that I love. Love. It's a perfect, it's literally a perfect anime. So I told you, I'm trying to get you, I'm trying to get JJK, Jujutsu Kaisen to be up there. I'm trying to, I've, we, I've, oh, dog, every that's time a, I see you, I sell it to you. <laughs> dog, you know, it's my, it's, that was just my top three. Yeah, like, yeah, they're yeah. still, they're still Bleach, they're still Attack on Titan, JJK, yeah. like, JJK just puts me in a world of pain, like, <laughs> like I'm gonna get it, I'm gonna get it to one and two, I promise you, I promise okay, you, I gotta see. do. <laughs> Well, what kind of somewhat his his joint is um Tokyo Ghoul. Oh, that's a good Ooh, one. Oh, that's so good. Yeah, that's a good yeah one he too. was him for Halloween a couple times with the uh the patch and all that stuff. Oh, that's fine. So, that's super fire. Um, how do you maintain balance with balancing it all? Like, since you have college, the college access career, you know, education, podcasting, and mm -hmm. everything else. What's how do you maintain balance as far as like time management and overall balance? Yeah, um, time management wise, I, I have my dedicated days to like content. And so normally uh, Monday nights is when I do my show. And then honestly, during my work hour, I try to like do everything within the first eight hours of my day. <laughs> um, and so like when I have my lunch breaks, I like to just like editing is mindless work for me now. So I really just enjoy doing it because I'm just like, cool, I can do this within I got my rhythm and cadence down. So it's a lot easier to do a lot of my stuff during my work shift. Um, and then afterwards, it's like my time for me, right? And so Mondays, I know, are podcasting days. Thursdays, I go volunteer at the Philly prison. 
Um, Saturdays, those are my brunch times. I don't, <laughs> don't, I don't interrupt me during my brunch hours. <laughs> um, and so like, I keep time for me, but I try to not do the thing where I have to do, here's my nine to five, here's my five to nine. And then the thing that really like resets me every single day is like, I wake up at like five fifteen, five thirty every day. Um, it's just a teacher schedule in me. So I just naturally is there. <laughs> But I appreciate it because the sunrise is one of my favorite things to like witness. And so I'm just like, it reminds me like everything else is just like the world is still a huge place and the beauty of the sun will always be there. Um, but I also do like my 10, 10, 10 rule. So I need 30 minutes to myself before the rest of the world needs me. So like that quiet time is so like integral. So I will get up, I will stretch, I will journal and I will sip my coffee whether that's music on the background or a podcast in the background, but like that 30 minutes is purely for Marquise before students need me, coworkers need me, friends need me, family needs me, the rest of them up later. For me, that 5.30 to like seven o'clock in the morning is like my favorite time of the day. I'm a morning person in solitude. Don't talk to me in the morning, mm. but <laughs> I'm by myself. That's how I uh, maintain my day. So I'm always going to get my me time no matter what. So, hmm, it sounds like you, you like protect your, protect your energy. Cause I'm about to say, how do you get your creative juices? But Ooh. yeah, I, I watch other people. I'm genuine. Like when I tell you, I am genuine fans of my friends and other art styles. Like I love watching photographers. I geek out watching like people dissect their own films and stuff of just like, here's why I chose the shot. Here's why I did this. I love like the nerdy science of like content creation. Yeah. Um, and then also like listening to other people's music, like that's all important to me. And then I read, I love, 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 love reading. And so like, those are things that keep my creative spark going. Cause I'm just like, once you see somebody else in their passion and like the thing they love talking about, I'm just like, ah, oh, I know that feeling. Let me go create again. Let me go do this thing. Because <laughs> I get excited off of other people who are, who are just so excited around their thing that they are really good at. So I'll be around friends. I don't even got to talk to them, but like I'll just hang out and like, hey, watch Balmore, like make this song or watch Cody do um, shoot an event or something like that or listen to people talk around like what's your favorite film? Why do you like this music? How do I construct this song type situation? Like that stuff to me is so dope. That's really fire, man. Mm -hmm. that, that's, that's, that's refreshing to hear for sure. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like for us, like we, this is what the pod's about is really just digging into people's passions and how they got to where they got to. So like mm -hmm. knowing that kind of something that like fills you up too is, is, is fantastic. Um, one of my, one of our favorite questions is if you had to pick an album to describe where you, album mixtape would describe where you are in life right now, what would it be and why? Oh, or it could even be a song. It could be a song too. Yeah. Album mixtape song that can describe where I'm currently at in life. You know, when they repeat the question, you know, it's a good question. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Not dead ass. Cause I'm standing there. I'm just like. What song has been speaking to me a lot more recently? Honestly, um, Black's Free, so for everybody, Six Lack, but Black, yeah. um, on his debut project, Free Black, um, he talks around, like, finally being able to, like, leave bad deals, excuse me, and then also making the music that he really loves and, like, what that means. And for me, I've, that song's been deeply resonating with me right now because I'm just like, oh, I'm... I'm really leaning into me. Like, this is really cool right now. So like that song has particularly been like standing out to me a lot in um, probably the last month and some change. Hi. That's dope. Mm -hmm. So this is a question we, of course, is part of our DNA that we ask everyone. Um, to you, what does it mean to be a disruptor? Ooh, I like that question. Um, for me to be a disruptor means to be means to you to radically use your imagination. Um, we get to make worlds that people are scared to exist in, things that people have not thought about yet, agitate the status quo um, in terms of like what everybody else is doing. And so for me, I always want to I, I love visionaries. I love pioneers who are able to say, cool, we've been doing this. But here's what we could also be doing and have you thought about this yet? And so for me, I'm just like, I love to create avenues of new ways of thinking or disrupting like 
the everydayness of a person. And so I get to do that through conversation. I get to do that through events. I get to do that through talking, all that good stuff. So yeah, that's a disruptor is somebody who kind of agitates the status quo. And that's dope. That's yeah. dope. All right. Well, that takes us to our time, Marquise. Mm -hmm. um, the most important thing is please let the people listening know where they can follow you, keep up with your work. Mm -hmm. Let us know. Let them know how I can keep up with you. Yeah, absolutely. So you can follow me across all social media um, at Marquise Davon. That's M-A-R-Q-U-I-S-E-D-A-V-O-N. I'm the host of the Keeping in a Bean podcast. I'm also the uh, dope co-host of the Heavy is the Crown podcast. So if you enjoy Bel Air, I get to just recap and deep dive on <laughs> Bel Air as a show with my boy Skip from BK. And then also I host an event called Due Diligence here in Philly as well, where we dissect local artist work. So it's like a tiny desk performance meets a rap radar kind of interview all together. So myself and Balmore do that as a duo. So um, yeah, that's where you can really find me. If not, find me in some coffee shop here in Philly. <laughs> that's where I like to spend my time. So we out here. That's very dope, man. I just want to say uh, on behalf of Disruptors, man, thank you so much for your thank time. You. Rapping with us, sharing your gems, talking about your life and talking about mm -hmm. your passion. It's, I, I can't tell you how much your voice is probably helping the next creator out there. Or just somebody just trying to learn more about themselves and you're, you're doing a fantastic job. And it was a blessing to just be able to highlight you and what you do. Nah, truly. I appreciate y'all. Like I, when I tell you I'm legit fans of the both of you, like anytime y'all got something like this space is so dope. I love hearing this podcast as well. Like I have been truly a fan of this show. So keep doing what y'all doing. I, I was happy. I was like, dang, dang, I'm I'm somebody like so no seriously like thank y'all uh, for creating this space too it's really good to hear these stories man thank you and um thank everybody for joining us once again um checking us out here on the pod and you know if you like what you heard like share subscribe you know um turn on your notifications for us so that you know if you're hearing us on audio it comes up or you know you're on our youtube you know stay locked in with us um, and it helps us have proof of concept that we work in over here and that, you know, we could keep bringing you more. So until next time, thank you for joining us here on the Disruptors and the Culture Podcast.